For every movie that gets made, there are thousands of movies that don't. There are thousands and thousands of writers in LA right now struggling to get their next screenplay out there into the world. We want to know what it takes to go into that creative process. We want to know what it takes to wake up every day when your script got rejected yesterday and come back and do it again and do it better. Today I am thrilled to have one of the greatest filmmakers, producers, and writers from Hollywood, Brian Koppelman. He has worked on movies, some of my favorite movies, Rounders, Ocean's 13, and The Illusionist, and many, many more. Hey, I'm Brian Koppelman. I'm a filmmaker. Some of my films are Rounders, Ocean's 13, Solitary Man. I'm also a podcaster. My podcast, The Moment, is on iTunes, and uh, thrilled to be here with Ramit today. Brian, welcome to the show. Hey, man, I'm so happy to be here. This is fun. You said, know this. Whatever your favorite movie is, at some point during the writing of it, the screenwriter felt completely lost. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that one up because um, I like to think about Francis Ford Coppola making The Godfather and knowing that there, there were days in the editing room of that movie even when they felt like it was a total failure. Mm. When they had cut the wrong things out, left the wrong things in, and they sat there and watched it and thought, this is a disaster. Mm -hmm. And all of us feel hopeless in those moments, but it's so important to remind yourself that the creative, being creative involves massive failure all the time. Okay. Because you are risking, you're risking a lot because we all have ego tied up in our imaginations. You know, ask anyone, do you have a good imagination? They're going to say yes. <laughs> Nobody wants to think they're boring yes. and they don't, right? So uh, when you put that stuff on the line and then uh, you, you, when you come up short, it hurts, you know? And if you're honest with yourself, which is like the second part of all this, if you're rigorous, you know, uh, because bundled in, you know, my, my message can sometimes sound um, idealistic because I do believe that you can locate your voice and I do believe that the clearest way to get somewhere is by finding that, that true voice and communicating it. And, and I encourage people to try every day. But the rigor is the difference maker. The, the, the sort of rigorous uh, uh, attention to uh, making what you do better and to, so, you know, to uh, create in as much, uh, with as much passion and uh, as in silencing your critical inner voice when you're first creating mm. and then to stop and apply rigor to judging it and to making it better. Part of that is, is uh, the feeling of oh, this is, uh, this is terrible. Yeah. Uh, and all of us f feel, um, last year my partner David and I uh, won an Emmy Award uh, as part of the team that made uh, ESPN 30 for 30s. Um, we had a, a, a 30 for 30 documentary called This Is What They Want um, about the tennis player Jimmy Connors and the US Open in 1991. Mm. And uh, I remember days, and Rolling Stone Magazine just did a list of all the 30 for 30s. And they said, out of all of them, this is what they want was the fifth best one. And I can remember day after day coming home, editing that movie and telling my wife and my kids that the day was like wasted because <sighs> um, we made it worse. Mm -hmm. You know, I watched, I was working, working all day, making changes, making changes. Uh, and then we would watch the thing at seven o'clock before going home and just know it was better yesterday <laughs> and it was terrible and you know you feel um stupid yeah and you feel um like it's unsolvable mm. and so then you have to wake up the next day and just go attack it as hard as you can again and you know once you've done it a few times yeah you some part of you knows you're in the middle of the process this is what it yeah. feels like I to feel, try to do something great yes i feel 98 percent self-loathing i want to kill myself but i in the distant recesses yeah. of my mind i know that it's probably going to be all right if i keep attacking it okay let's go to the the next um uh vine that you did this one was if you only have an hour a day to write look at that as a positive because it forces you to focus and work with intensity. Yeah, uh, so our first screenplay, um, Rounders, we, I had a full-time job, 
my partner, Dave, he was uh, bartending at night. Mm. And so he would be done bartending. I'd be waking up to go to my job. My wife cleared out uh, this storage area below the apartment uh, in which we were living. And it had, it was a terrible little room. It had a slop sink in it. It was a uh, room for basically like half a desk, one chair. Uh, one of us would sit on the floor. Usually I would sit on the floor, Dave would type. Sometimes we'd switch. And we committed to two hours a day before going to work. Um, and so it was two hours, not one hour. But in that two hours, first of all, it, one of the ways in which we knew we were doing the right thing and, and how you can know is I felt alive in those two hours in a way that was different than I felt at any other point during my day, right? Until I got back home to my wife and then my son. Now I have two kids, but then one. So that um, period of time, uh, I felt alive, engaged, like I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. Mm. Even though it was very hard, my head would hurt afterwards, right? Mm. I didn't quit my job because uh, I had gotten a, a, one of your questions I know later is a good piece of advice, but I had gotten a piece of advice that said, you know, don't quit your job because the pressure on you then to create will be so great, yes. it'll be thwarting, right? Yep. You want to eliminate anxiety, sources of anxiety when you're creating. So I've built a whole routine for myself that I, every day now that I, so that I put all that stuff at bay when I want to create. So in an hour a day, you just get rid of all the nonsense. You're going to come in there and you're going to do your thing because especially once you get a little momentum, just a little. And Hemingway talks about um, uh, leaving yourself like a wet edge. Yeah. So you do enough work, leave yourself a little roadmap for tomorrow, you'll be thinking about it you know, at night before you go to bed. Your subconscious will be working on yes. it. So when you walk in, boom. You know, if you're sitting there and you have six, seven hours, you know, first of all, how much really concentrated work can you do uh, in a day where you're like really at your top brain capacity? Yeah. Uh, unless you're some crazy programmer on tons of smart drugs. <laughs> you know, not that many hours of con true concentrated yeah. focus. So yeah, I think an hour a day. First of all, you go back to that page, you write two pages maybe, three. Yeah. I don't know, if, what if you wrote three pages a day in an hour? It would be amazing. In a month you'd have a screenplay. <sighs> and, and you want a novel, a 300 page novel in three months. It, 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 it takes me back to the hellish process of writing my book, this book I wrote on personal finance. Yeah. And just like you, uh, an hour, two hours before work every day at a coffee shop and coming home, resting for about like 30 minutes, writing for another hour and then going to sleep for two years. But, but I, I love what you said about cutting away the BS. If I was sitting there on a Saturday, I mean, I'm like, oh, I should do this. Let me make some tea. And then, oh, I don't know if this is going to be good. Let me research all these books. With one hour, you have to write. Otherwise, you walk out of that room with nothing on the page. You know, to you, that piece of material is everything, right? You spend yes. all this time crafting, creating. And what you really want is somebody to read it. And it could be in any area of life, right? Uh, it could be um, the plans, if you're an architect, that you've given to the client. Right? Uh, or your bid, if you're in advertising, your presentation that you've spent 20 hours a day on for three months. What you really want, if you're honest with yourself, is the person to read the script, stand up, say, I never have to read anything else again, yeah. and jump out the window and kill themselves. <laughs> because that's what you feel like your work should, yes, uh, of the, the result of this work, right? That's never going to happen. Mm. And because you know what? They're doing 25 things that day. Maybe that day the head of the agency said, hey guys, we can't tell anybody. We can't afford to take on new clients. So for the next month, you have to pass on everything. What if I read something great? It doesn't matter. If they're not earning money right now, it's a blanket pass. Mm. Great, can I tell people? No, because then they'll know that we can't spend money because I have to refinance. Well, we don't know that on the other end of it, right. right? All we know is the no, which feels like judgment from a God above. Yeah. And so right away that taught me like uh, a rejection only means something. Uh, it, it's a useful tool if it makes you look, when you can get to the place where you can look objectively at your work and measure it against the rejection. Mm. Okay, this person said X. Do I see X in this? If I do, is X a problem? If it is, can I remediate that problem? Is it fatal? If the problem's fatal, 
do I get that from three other people? Okay, there's this fatal problem. I either have to fix it or put this one aside and go on to the next one. But the fact of the rejection alone, meaningless. Mm -hmm. uh, and I learned it early and I've been able to hold fast to that so that when the illusionist was rejected by everybody, I never doubted for a second it was gonna be a movie that could do 100 million worldwide, which is what it did. Mm -hmm.